this question that may seem stupid to some of, of you, and you know, if it does, then that's a good thing because we have something to debate about whether this could even be, you know, become the future standard for all kinds of in-browser multimedia communication. There could be reasons for and against, so you know, I'd like to have a rather lively debate here. Uh, to give a very quick overview of what this is all about, in case you have not heard of RTC Web or WebRTC before, first of all, you may hear both names, and uh, this is about a set of standards <coughs> being developed in the ITF and in W3C. Now, in W3C, they call it WebRTC. In the ITF, they call it RTC Web. Uh, in W3C, they're doing the API. In RTC Web, they're doing protocols. And, you know, in the end, it's all the same, <coughs> the same big story. Uh, the idea is that you can point your, uh, your web browser to some web server and uh, maybe one web server or maybe multiple that can talk to each other. But anyway, you go to some website and uh, somebody else goes to some website and <laughs> then signaling happens, punching holes through uh, nets and uh, ensuring that communication could somehow work. And in the end, what you would hopefully get from this is uh, this direct peer-to-peer -peer commun communication between browsers. So this is the essence of what WebRTC is about, is that it's um, establishing direct communication between two browsers that could then be used for multimedia communication. So you could have phone conferences that work on a pure peer-to-peer -peer fashion directly between browsers. And uh, a lot of work has gone into this signaling and, and into various things there. Uh, a big, a big part of this story, I should probably also tell before we get into the de debate, is that uh, there is some effort to agree on at least one fallback for all audio and video codecs, uh, such that if you have two systems that are supposed to interoperate, and you know, if, you have, if each system has a variety of codecs, in case that they don't have the same, well, at least they have one single one that has been agreed upon that would be available everywhere, such that communication works. Um, that has, of course, led to a lot of debate related to RPR and all kinds of things in, in the ITF. Now, the panelists we have here, um, we have Harald Alveston, who, you know, that guy here. <laughs> he has uh, worked with the internet since 1984, has in, uh, with internet standards since 91, has a long history in the ITF, works for Google in Stockholm, and uh, the reason for bringing him, him, him here is that he is quite deeply involved in this whole WebRTC, RTC web work. Uh, his focus in, is in developing WebRTC in Chrome and contributing to the standards process for WebRTC. Then uh, Xavier Mariu, who is uh, yes, waving here <laughs> next to Harold, uh, has worked in the area of voice networks since 96, has been working on VoIP since 99, and uh, since t 2003 works for France Telecom Orange attends the ITF groups related to VoIP and uh, is currently working on how to integrate WebRTC within Orange networks and services. Then we have Christian Timmerer on the far end, uh, an assistant professor from Alpen Adria University Klagenfurt with research interests in immersive multimedia communication, streaming, adaptation, quality of experience. And uh, you yeah, have heard him speak about MPEG Dash yesterday. So he has more than 10 years of experience in MPEG standardization and uh, has worked on MPEG Dash, with, uh, which is currently integrated in VLC and the Mozilla Firefox, among others. And whereas the MPEG column at X ACM SIGMM records. And finally, uh, next to me here is Max Mühlheiser, who is head of the Taylor Corporation Lab at the Technical Uni University of Darmstadt in Germany, and uh, this lab works on smart ubiquitous computing environments for the pervasive future internet in the fields of middleware and infrastructures, novel multi uh, multimodal interaction techniques, and uh, human protection and ubiquitous computing. Now, my point in bringing him here was that he would hopefully give us you know, a somewhat broader <coughs> view on that whole uh, WebRTC topic and, and well, what its impacts may be. He's got over 25 years of experience in research and teaching in various areas, had held various professorships. And, uh, okay, I have some questions that I'd, I'd like to ask, but that will be after everyone has uh, introduced themselves. So I <coughs> hand over to, who, well, to Christian, because his slides are the ones that are just open here. <laughs> okay. The idea is that each panelist will give like 
quick overview on this views. Yeah, please. Okay. Well, I, I put a couple of slides together. First, kind of motivation, and probably most of you know this kind of slide that, that video is predominant on the internet. Actually, the numbers are a little bit old, so probably they have been updated uh, uh, quite recently. But one can see that, that the red bar is about real-time entertainment, so about uh, video streaming, uh, probably also video communication, but there is also real-time communication there. But you can see video on the internet, and especially when you look into mobile devices, is becoming more and more uh, important. The graphic is, uh, the, the traffic is growing, uh, and also the bandwidth is growing. And we need to find a way how to deal with that and probably it will also enable new kind of services. Uh, I mean, and that's why probably also WebRTC and RTC Web is being developed. On the other hand side, there is uh, MPEG Dash being developed. So there are kind of two different ways on how to deal with media or multimedia on the web. So on the one hand side, I tried to compare that somehow. So I hope I'm not saying something completely stupid, but uh, we, we probably might have time to, to discuss it here. Uh, so on the one hand side, we have RTC Web, WebRTC, and the other hand side, there is something, the media source extensions. Uh, so the left hand side is topic to the discussion here. Uh, it's more about the real-time communication, whereas the media source extensions, that's an API, which is allowing for uh, adaptive HTTP streaming uh, within the web environment. So that's why I put it here as a real-time entertainment. So it's more or less a one-directional way of communicating uh, media from a source to, to probably uh, multiple uh, receivers in an adaptive and probably as a time shift live uh, streaming. Interestingly, they are using kind of different protocols, different formats. So uh, the, the media source extensions are mainly relying on HTTP or HTTPS uh, itself. Typically, people think that uh, uh, um, HTTPS is probably not needed because the content is DRM encrypted anyway and you need to deal with it. So we have seen uh, the, the keynote some raising some issues uh, that, that, that might be in this area. On the one hand, on the other side, there is RTP or the secure uh, RTP for the data framing and securing and you have uh, one reason why HTTP streaming, adaptive HTTP streaming is becoming more and more popular was about the net issues, but it seems they have solved it. So there are different technologies where you can uh, solve the, the, the net traversal uh, issues uh, with the protocols in the acronyms mentioned here. There is even a kind of data channel which is using the, the stream control transmission protocol. Uh, and uh, on the other hand side, the media source extensions, well, they, they, they favor some kind of byte stream formats which are based on WebM the ISO-based media file format, so most of you know that as MP4 or segmented MP4 files, or MPEG-2 transport stream, which is very uh, very much known and used in the, in the broadcasting industry. Interestingly, it has been already mentioned uh, by, by Michael, is that, that uh, RTC Web, they have chosen to select the mandatory to implement codec, whereas the media source extensions, they just agreed here on the byte stream format, okay? That there are different choices, but the codecs are deliberately excluded. And the reason why I think they have done it is, okay, well, there are different codecs, so it's always one way of communicating it. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're sure your clients uh, will support a number of codecs, you just offer different streams in different codecs, and the client can select which one to choose, which is probably not a good idea for, for RTC Web, where the, there is a bi-directional communication and they need to agree on some kind of codec. Uh, but I don't actually want to go into this kind of codec discussions because that's much more a, 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 a has probably a lot of to do with, with some legal issues and so on. Of course, we can do it. But I also try to highlight some of the research challenges, which I think we are facing uh, in this area, and uh, on top of it, uh, trying to find a way on how to combine this real-time communication, so the bidirectional conversational services, uh, conversational services, and the entertainment, so the, 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 the live streaming, the video on demand uh, use cases. And for RTC web, uh, it's mainly talking about browsers, so I'm not talking about browsers, I'm talking about web applications, because if you look at the first RTC web, 
demonstrations, they come as apps on the phone. They are not implemented in the browser on the phone. That's a separate app. You can probably already download some of them. But not only on phones or mobile devices, but also apps on, on notebooks or even smart TVs uh, might probably be able to use it. And also Cyril mentioned this hybrid broadcast broadband in, in one of his questions. So that's also kind of, kind of interesting. And, and the question is, can we combine that without putting too much burden on the implementers? I mean, if you look back at the different protocols which need to be supported right now, starting from, from RTP, uh, TCP, different codecs, different payload formats, different uh, container formats, I mean, that's probably kind of burden for the, for the, for the developers. Uh, and, and having a common framework, hopefully, not sure it will, will work, having a common segment format or payload format would, would of course help the deployment of these kind of use cases. And these use cases are coming because the bandwidth is growing. The bandwidth will be there. Uh, new codecs are being developed. Just look at HAVC. Uh, and, and, and I just saw, because we have a representative from Orange, there was a, there was a, 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 a a story on the web I read that, that Orange is going to work on Dash plus HAVC deployment. So, so that's probably something that, that is coming soon. Another topic of research, which is even already started to be standardized in the ITF, is this interdestination media synchronization, IDMS. And I know a lot of people are, are working on that. But currently, ITF is more focusing on this push based media delivery using RTP. But how does it work for the bull-based media delivery, such as it used in, in MPEG Dash? And of course, finally, what is the impact of all these kind of additional services on the quality of experiences, and specifically, as we talk about multimedia communication, about the multimedia experience? And well, there is this conference I mentioned that last uh, yesterday already, which is is dealing with some issues there. So I'd like to stop here now. Of course, there are some some more slides about, yeah, you know, this special issue and so on, but uh, I'm not sure how to proceed now, whether you yeah, should take any uh, questions or... Well, I mean, uh, yes, we, we can already go into discussions if somebody but has something to say as questions or, you know, this, this is supposed to be a discussion thing, so... That's up to you. But if, you know, if nobody raises a question or nobody... Yes, okay. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Christian. I think the the questions you ask are uh, very interesting, and maybe for my knowledge about WebRTC, RTC Web. Um, so you mentioned in the introduction that some work is being done at IETF, some work is being done at, at W3C. So what will you have to implement? Can you implement just the IETF part and and have real time communication between two applications? What does the W3C uh, spec add? Uh, so there will be a JavaScript API, and uh, any website developer will be able to just write something in JavaScript that controls what's going on. But can you implement an application without JavaScript? So this would be for Harold. Uh, so the reason for the split is as much ideology as anything else. The ITF traditionally does not do APIs. And uh, W3C traditionally doesn't do protocols. In order to have something useful, we had to have communication, which is a protocol. We had to have an API so that JavaScript applications can, could get to it, which is an API. So we had to have both working on it. In fact, we, have, uh, we had the last three day, a three-day meeting in Boston where we had the morning being W3C and the afternoon being IETF. So we had uh, a lot of jokes about the guys after lunch are going to change, uh, are, are not going to agree with this. Everyone knowing that it was the same people. So it's one integrated unit. The fact that it's in two organizations is uh, for various reasons. But uh, it's in, uh, but, but uh, think of it as one thing. Uh, I wrote the overview document. There's an explicit statement in there saying that as long as you talk the right protocols, nobody cares if you're a dog. Or nobody cares whether you have a JavaScript engine or not. Uh, if you can behave according to the protocols, 
nobody knows what you are and nobody cares. That's how protocols operate. So I expect many people to implement boxes that don't have browsers running on them, which talk to things that are written to talk to browsers. There's nothing okay. more to add from my side. Maybe, what? There's nothing more to add from my yeah, side. Yeah, so uh, let's, uh, let's maybe move on and, and see if, you know, some other views on that uh, if, you know, so before, we, before we get into the deeper debate. So I know Xavier has done some slides and uh, Max has slides, so up to you guys. Do you have them on your yeah, computer? Yeah, I, I have them. Okay, I have slides also. So who is it? Okay. As they were some questions suggested by one of the organizers, I've tried to give some starts, so, some my thoughts about possible answers. So this first slide is just an introduction. So it basically says what Michael said before. Um, just I just want to remember that uh, in WebRTC uh, there are basically two components. Uh, relating to the related to the media pass, uh, there is a media pass which is real time with secure RTP for transporting audio and video from browser to browser. But there's also another component which is let's say less real time uh, for other data besides audio and video, uh, uh, which is uh, the SCTP over DTLS channel, which is also known as a data channel. Um, the the one question that was suggested was, uh, could RTC Web or Web RTC become the future for all in-browser multimedia communication? Uh, well, my feeling uh, by participating to the standardization meetings is that so far, the number one priority for most Web RTC players is really voice over IP. They, they want voice over IP in the browser without having to install any plugin. However, uh, there are other types of use cases uh, that may arise because, um, as I said before, there is a second component, which is a data channel, uh, which enables different use cases, such as sending one uh, small type of information from one browser to another one. And with this data channel, you may, you may even transfer some chunk of file, or even one file, or even uh, 10 files if you want. Um, so we may think about, uh, for example, peer-to-peer -peer distribution of files with this data channel uh, directly from browser to browser. And as Harald said before, uh, you can also envisage to have somewhere in the network uh, a kind of server implementing the, beha the behavior of a browser. And um, you may think about implementing, for example, this um, SCTP endpoint in order to deliver file. Um, however, personally, I don't think uh, it's so worthful to do it because uh, uh, if you implement SCTP, for example, on DTLS and so on, and, uh, then it's like in implementing RTSP and RTP, and uh, it has proven not to be so firewall friendly, which means that um, most deployments today use HTTP streaming. So I don't really see HTTP streaming in the network being replaced uh, by, uh, an, let's say, SCTP server for delivering video on demand files, for example. So this is my vision today of the, of the big picture. Of course, one question you may have is, can we use uh, the SRTP channel for transferring unidirectional video as well? Um, I I don't have the answer to this question because uh, so far it hasn't been discussed, at least in standardization. So this, I mean, since, since we're at it, I'd, I'd like to discuss that question a bit. I mean, this was really a question I had that because we're agreeing on codex here, because this is supposed to interoperate and because it's supposed to work everywhere. 
Okay. Yeah, fine, fine. Okay. So I, I think this was the slide that takes mo the most time. Uh, question two was um, about the data channel. Uh, could it could this become a new platform for tomorrow peer-to-peer -to -peer file sharing tools? Uh, well, in my opinion, it it has the power to 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 become so. There's even a use case in the in the current draft of the RTC working group for the data channel where it is explicitly written that you can transfer a file. Um, you can even prototype it, for example, with a nightly release of Firefox. Uh, it's coming also in Chrome. Um, personally, I have a student that is working on this use case, um, but we haven't implemented everything yet. Uh, so there are still some additional work needed and I think the, the good point is really for the service provider because it m using peer-to-peer -peer in addition to client to server may offload uh, the, the web server site. So for example when user A has already downloaded one file on the server, if user B um, also wants the, f the same file, the web server can redirect it to user A, provided user A is eligible, of course. Uh, so this may be interesting for the service provider. For the network, um, I would say that it's not so good because SRTP is, uh, d sorry, DTLS for the data channel encrypts everything, so it prevents um, implicit intermediaries to, to perform caching. So this is just a picture uh, showing what I said before. For example, if browser B, C, and D wants to uh, build a, a file, and if browser A already has some chunks of the file, th the chunks can be uh, retrieved by browser A. And there was also a question three, which is completely different, which was raised. Uh, what is the real broad impact you all envision? Is it just another toy or more? Um, personally, for me, it's not a toy because uh, the web is here, definitely here, and uh, every single application that exists today uh, must run in a web browser if you want that users can benefit from your application. So far, voice over IP, ha voice over IP has been resisted resisted to this paradigm and with WebRTC voice over IP arrives in the web browser so we definitely need it uh, however as I underline uh, it should not remain an isolated tool because we for example as a provider we already have uh, as a voice provider we already have a lot of devices uh, that use uh, some other technologies besides WebRTC. And with WebRTC, there are things that are new, but we have things that are not so new in the network. And of course, each time you have something new, you have to map to find a certain degree of compatibility between new things and older things. And in this case, for example, uh, we are strongly, we would really like to have some already existing codex in our networks to be compatible with the codecs being used in WebRTC. So this is the most important example we have uh, from our side as, as a voice or operator, I would say. Some discussion. Harold, you, you have to have some views on these things that have been said. Yes, I, <laughs> I want to do a, a three-minute chunk first. So okay. I think, uh, I, I, are you done? So then we can yes. Hand, yes. Please. How about, okay. I, mm, okay, yeah. I mean, any, he's, he's going to raise more questions. So I think it would be good if you to then. To Xavier, otherwise, we continue. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Okay, let me throw in my view on this. Uh, I try to make it uh, just fit on one, on one slide. Basically, my view on WebRTC is the following. We have a browser and we have an extension. And in, in my view, that extension concentrates on 
browser to browser communication in the sense of client to client. So in my view, this, the strength of WebRTC is on uh, bypassing the server, if you wish, direct client to client uh, interaction. And I think that strength and that focus uh, should be leveraged first in order to make it successful because there's so many standards and toys and, and, and uh, approaches out and, and it's very difficult to, to make one of these uh, really become successful, you know. And, and this is why I think we should start on, on, on that paradigm and for the time being not focus on server-based things like uh, media entertainment that, that Christian has raised. It, there is a point in this, but I see it as the second wave, you know. In the first wave, I would really concentrate on browser to browser or rather client to client um, uses and uh, try to make this a success, which is difficult enough uh, and which will definitely require killer apps or, or a good argument for people to really um, buy in. Um, this simplified view can be extended uh, with uh, the connect to the content. Basically, today WebRTC supports uh, mainly audio and video, uh, which for me is two types of content. And it, of course, connects uh, to the I.O. devices locally in order to, to capture and stream. Okay, that's, that's basically the current picture. And now the question comes, uh, what is the potential of WebRTC in this picture? Um, already many have raised the issue that there might be different devices out there. Voice over IP, uh, uh, telephones for instance, may easily be connected out there. Uh, baby phones, uh, all kinds of, of, of secondary <coughs> devices that you may think of. Um, uh, to me, an even more important uh, approach comes from the fact that uh, PCs are basically dying out. Um, the, the real take on is on, on smartphones, mobile devices. We have many more mobile devices hooked up to the internet today than uh, PCs and, and, and the standard devices on which browsers were ran, running in the past. So um, both PC to PC, if you wish, and face to face communication uh, in the sense of what we do with mobile phones uh, and mobile devices uh, should be embraced by WebRTC. And that's not difficult, it's just something you have to think about and to uh, take into consideration. And there have been debates whether things like connecting to voice over IP telephones and to other devices is already well reflected in, in, the, in the deep uh, technical details of the standard. So this makes it uh, a very general approach for client-to-client -client communication, including mobile devices. On, on the path to the left, um, there, is, there are things coming up like secondary screens, um, connection of mobile device, uh, web tablets with LCD screens, etc. That requires uh, approaches for um, configuring your different devices into a consistent uh, user interface. That's also something that WebRDC could embrace in this context. And of course, there are more important types of context, content. If you think uh, client to client, then the basic notion that you have in mind is that of uh, Skype or any other uh, instant messaging like uh, um, application. And then text, of course, is something to embrace. And uh, you would say, well, we have done this for, for decades. But today, uh, the landscape there with uh, SMS text and WhatsApp and uh, all kinds of instant messaging based, uh, some Skype based, um, is, is, is really uh, a highly fragmented landscape. And an approach like this one here may help to unify that and finally come up with a, with a single uh, interface to that. And then, of course, uh, screen sharing comes up next as, as an important requirement. Calendars, uh, business cards, exchanges that, that OBEX uh, supports today. There's a lot of comfort you could add and make client-to-client uh, -client communication really uh, a comfortable thing that, that really outperforms what we have on the market today um, and on the theme. And, and there are even more advanced things like, uh, you know, um, handing over some, some, some money coins in, in, in the sense of wallet-to-wallet -wallet transfer 
and I'll get to that in a minute again. Okay, with all this, uh, we have to um, consider legacy codecs and legacy multimedia approaches, legacy um, uh, instant messaging systems, of course, and, and we have to find a way how to embrace them and how to be better than them. Well, and then there's one part um, about which I didn't find a lot in the standards discussion up to now. Um, basically, the kinds of management tools that you want to add to such a system. Obviously, one thing you immediately want to have is, is contacts, you know. And uh, of course, this connects us to legacy um, online social networks like Facebook, uh, Google Plus, et cetera. You know, how to interface with uh, contacts and directories of, of these, but also of, of instant messaging systems. But if you do want to do a client-to-client -client communication, contacts is something you, you definitely want, awareness of who is online and offline, et cetera. Um, then there may be, you know, as I said, new um, additional functionalities coming up, like for instance, uh, think of you doing something that is either privacy, uh, um, um, uh, that, that needs privacy awareness or that has financial or legal implications and you wanna be sure you're talking to the right person over the network. Then you could use audio video transfer to make sure by just uh, normal communication that you're talking to the right people and if the infrastructure underneath then allows you to say, well, I've now authenticated that other person because we've just talked to one another and I now click a button and then I get a um, secure communication to that person and, and the system makes sure I get connected to exactly the person I just saw on the video, then you have very uh, uh, human and, and very, very natural and, and user-friendly way of, of authenticating people on the fly. Just one example, Auth uh, anonymous credentials may be included, um, support for cooperation aware user interfaces is not a big deal anymore once you have support for second screen um, as I've shown on the left. And uh, one more thing, I think there's also a market for enabling private con uh, conversations as client to client uh, bypassing Facebook and Google servers, you know. There's always the need for, or, or, or a niche for a uh, truly private conversation, and that could be a, another add-on to OSNs. Uh, so th there's, these are just a few ideas about, you know, how we could uh, add to the functionality that we find all over the network and all over the web uh, in order to make this more attractive and, and make our, our uh, horse for client-to-client um, communication. And once we are successful in that field, we could then move on and say, now what about peer-to-peer -peer streaming of video uh, and, and what about even entertainment? And of course, in order to make this um, be successful, there's still a number of technical issues to be resolved and maybe we, we can get to some of them in the discussion. There have been issues about uh, the, is this peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, connectivity really stateless? Uh, does it have to, uh, too much STP legacy involved and, and so it's not really stateless? Um, what about the, the, you know, punching holes in, in net, and, net and firewalls? Is it the right approach? Um, I think yes, um, given, given the weird world that we are living in. Um, what about mandatory to implement um, codecs? Um, I also believe in these in order to assure a minimal functionality between clients. Uh, but these technical issues, of course, have to be straightened also. That's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to Harold. So I don't believe in Schleidware, especially because I'm a very bad, bad drawer. Uh, but I was thinking about what do I want to talk about today? There's huge amounts of things we could talk about in WebRTC. I like this picture. It shows just how complex the world can be. But there's kind of like three things we could talk, talk about in general. There's the what. What are we trying to do? There's the how. How we're actually going to get through the firewalls, fiddle the bits, transfer the data, and so on and so forth. And there's the why. 
Now the why is perhaps the least talked about and perhaps the most important, so I'll talk about that. Looking back a couple of years, you're one of the more po most powerful technology companies in the world. You just released video conferencing for free for everyone. And you find, no, this is not changing the world. Interactive work on the web is still a speciality thing. You need to deploy plugins. You need a licensed technology. You need to get what you have into every, every PC on the planet, and now every phone, in order to get it deployed. That effectively means that the number of applications you're going to get is not thousands, it's not hundreds, it's tens. And ten applications, no matter how marvelous, will not change the world. The web showed a different way of approaching how to get new things out there. Build a platform. Make a playing field in which anyone, anywhere, could write and deploy a new application and have it useful for a huge number of people immediately. Not a thousand applications. Not 10,000 applications. Let there be a million applications. So, instead of finding the way to do interactive multimedia in yet another closed system, creating yet another walled garden, we decided to try something else. Let's make every web browser a platform in which anyone who knows how to write 20 lines of JavaScript can get real-time interactive applications running, deployed, and useful to the world. Big hairy goals. And that vision has shaped a lot of the details, including the question of the codec. No matter, if you look at the codec field for video codecs, one aspect of it is that the lack of revolutions. A codec of 10 years ago is almost the same, given a few fiddles, like 100% uh, better, um, as, it as, it, as it is today. And the reasons for that come down to one particular aspect. Patent licensing. If you read the MPEG LA patent licenses, you will realize that this is not just about, oh, you pay a penny and get the hardware. It's about if you want to deliver stuff that costs money over the internet, you got to pay the toll keeper. This means no small businesses. Again, the million applications won't happen. We're down to the thousands who actually can afford the lawyers. This is not good for the internet. So, we are succeeding in the primary goal of getting 
the web application platform that we usually call browsers, which will occur in many other forms over the next years, to support real-time applications that allow audio and video interactive speeds to work without the people who actually write the applications, who think of the new things we can do, the million flowers that bring the fruits of this revolution, we are succeeding in getting that out in the marketplace, out to be useful, getting it to be an empowering technology. But we are not fully there yet. We got to get to the point where everyone can use the technology freely. Because that's the thing that makes the internet better. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be the microphone carrying person. I'll do that. <laughs> so if, if we look at HTML5, the way it progressed and the way it, why it became a success is because it got rid of Flash, right? And one of the key success for getting rid of Flash was the key factor of getting rid of Flash was Apple not uh, allowing the Flash player on on um, on iPhone. Now you want to get rid of Skype. What will be the equivalent? W why will people switch to WebRTC instead of using Skype? That's the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> Skype in order to survive, will probably embrace WebRTC. It will be yet another WebRTC application because that will make deployment of Skype clients easier. It's cheaper for them. But if you focus on the enemy, you become the enemy. If HTML5 had focused on replacing Flash, it would have become Flash. It's not. So WebRTC's promise is not, to my mind, that it allows cheaper vi video phones. It's that it allows communication where you want it, when you want it, for the purpose you want it. I was uh, chatting with a friend who was, who was uh, saying, oh, I used to use this uh, use uh, Google Hangouts for watching over my baby. He put one PC next to the baby and one PC in the living room. But now it comes up with this pop-up every hour saying, are you still there? I want to disconnect. And I said, why don't you just use the WebRTC de demo program instead? I mean, there are millions of purposes for which real-time communication is appropriate. And video conferencing is just one of them. More audience views uh, questions, I think. So. Okay, in this case, I'll have a question for Christian, who, who in the email discussion brought up the question of whether we really need to have a mandatory to implement codec. And I found it interesting to see that uh, Dash made the decision to not do that. So, views, what, what's, you know, why, why is that bad? Well, I, t I think I tried to explain it. So, so for a content provider, it's kind of easy to provide multiple versions, right, <laughs> of the different content in different codecs, and the client can just select depending on what is installed on the client device. For WebRTC, I mean, you might have a different opinion, right? <laughs> and speaking as uh, someone who's talked to people at YouTube, every time we add another codec, remember, it's now at 72 hours of video uploaded every minute. And every time 
we double the number of codecs, we do double the number of disk amount of disk space needed. <laughs> well, if you go from four codecs to five codecs, it's not that bad. <laughs> but uh, supporting multiple codecs is expensive. The nice thing about uh, ab about uh, a stored video system is that it's just expensive. So. In the case of a, of a direct communication, <coughs> you don't have the luxury of, uh, of just picking up the other file and spell, spend some more disk. Because if you don't have the same codec, it just doesn't work. It's not that it's good for, it's not that it's free for, for content providers, it's that it's possible for content providers. It's not possible for the interactive guys. So well, yes, but but Codex they have a limited lifetime, right? So, <laughs> you know, I mean, right now, if you if you look in the industry, I mean, AVC is kind of uh, adopted very broadly. HAVC is something which is promising even even more compression efficiency and allowing for even higher resolutions and so on. So. Sooner or later, probably HAVC will simply replace AVC. And, and then if you put something mandatory to implement. Uh, connection management and um, uh, overall context management. Is WebRTC, ITF, or uh, W3C uh, considering actually uh, how the management will happen? Um, is it the SIP based, right? Sort of, is it uh, the next generation of uh, some SIP uh, or control? Uh, you mentioned sort of the uh, inter receiver type of uh, synchronization. How about inter sender? I mean, when it's multi party, browsers to browsers, right? Uh, some kind of <coughs> control uh, will have to be there. Um, what happens? I am just we have two people in queue, Xavier first and then Max. <laughs> yes, Let's regarding go. the codex, I have many things also to say. Uh, you say having multiple codex is expensive for YouTube. Well, in case we have just one or two codex within WebRTC endpoints and we have legacy endpoints on the other side, then it also costs a lot of money for the service provider to transcode uh, for example, let's say G711 into another codec. And if I made, uh, I would make two points. That the first one is that on the, there's an RFC about um, the architectural principles of the internet, which says that uh, heterogene heterogeneity is inevitable and m must be supported. So I think for the codec, it should be the same. And if I can make an analogy with languages, for example, let's say I have two users that can sp that are native speaker for French, and if I have, if I say them, you have to speak English between you two because it's like that. Uh, is well, the the voice quality will not be the same; it will be worse, and in the end, it's really a pity because if we could avoid it, it would be r really better. You want to? I think we are the wrong people here to, to, to discuss this. We should talk to end users, you know, and, and any hassle they get will make them not embrace an, uh, something that comes up. And we're, we're in a highly competitive area. So if we believe in something, we have to make sure it's embraced and, and we have uh, apps to start with. I, I totally agree with you. There should be uh, the road towards millions of apps, but there ha have to be a few that uh, people really like and uh, you know that that ensure the success and the same goes for for mandatory to implement codex you know um, I think even if you tell people you have to download your new browser plus you have to download your codec it's not going to work for ordinary people they just don't do it you know it has to be included in in the browser and they just fire off the browser they connect to to a friend and it works you know everything else is just going to fail and if in two or three years vp8 is superseded what the heck i mean we we, we install new versions of browsers every other week you know it's al always fun that we ha this these debates spend all the way from ideology to bits 
I actually did a calculation on the transcoding thing where when we had this discussion the last time based on the <coughs> based on the the price of hardware at Rackspace and the number of uh, channels that you said you could transcode and uh, the cost of the, the cost in dollars of uh, transcoding between G711 and G722 was uh, well Negligible is a too large word. It was extremely small. Uh, so we have a lot of arguments that are really based, re re really not going to be what matters in the end. I think you're very right in that uh, that people will adopt what works for them. And uh, what we should always aim for is to make sure things work. Now, if you want to run a business, you first have to have a business model that's uh, at least plausible. So before you can run a business, uh, can get people to use a business, you've got to have business, to business for them to use. So the, so the people who run businesses are important too, like our friends. Mario here. But uh, yes, you're right. If end users have to be able to use the thing right out of the box, no matter what their other choices are. That's why it's so important to get the platform right. Yes. I would like to change the discussion a little bit uh, because good, we were yeah. good on plan the to call data it plane. I would like to move to the control plane uh, with respect to the web RTC. And I think Max. I guess it's Harold, yeah. You know, when we started the WebRTC thing, and uh, especially in the charter discussions in the ITF, we were seeing that, okay, there are people who will demand SIP and will always have, always say, SIP is the answer. What was the question? And uh, there are people who will say just about the same thing about Jabber and say that SIP is a hateful device from a uh, misdesigned device of, uh, from long ago that has been ruined by the evil touch of GGPP. People are very polite when they say this. <laughs> but uh, uh, so the decision of the people who wrote the charter was that we have to focus on what we absolutely have to get into the browser. So there was a deliberate decision to say that what the actual negotiation protocol is, is not going to be part of this level of standardization. So there's no mention, there's no specification of SIP in the standards for, for WebRTC. There's no specification of XMPP. There are people who have written, here's how you do SIP over WebRTC. There's people who have written, how Here's how to, how you to do Jabber over a WebRTC. But the WebRTC layer is agnostic. The browser doesn't have to care. And that's by design. Yes. Um, a question to Xavier, maybe. You mentioned in your slides that so you have this uh, real-time communication channel for audio and video, and then you have data channel for uh, that that's non real time, but I assume that there's also a possibility to transfer real time data uh, together with with the audio and video, like blackboard uh, drawings and or I don't know in the future uh, scent or three D data or whatever. Is it the case, or does the data have to go through this non non real time channel? Yes, for example, you can share the, your, the, your screen and your experience on the screen. Uh, well, the, the video can be sent into the audio real-time real -time channel, for example. Uh, maybe Harold wants to add a comment. By using the data channel, you can get uh, data through the same real-time properties as the, as the vo voice and video. It also goes peer-to-peer. -peer. And uh, with the same, quali the same qualities include that uh, 
that if you if it doesn't get there on the first like, first attempt, you don't get it. That is, uh, you can you can have a lossy channel. You can also have a lossless channel, but in that case, it will be slightly slower if you lose packets. So we're trying to be all things to all people. I forget to add something, which is that uh, the, the real-time channel for SRTP, the data is generated by the browser itself. It's triggered by the application, but it's the browser that decides to send the data uh, within this channel. With the data channel, it's, the it's up to the application to generate the content or to retrieve it from one or another part and to send it in the data channel. This is also an important difference. So to, this reminds me of what Christian was saying. How do you mix real-time entertainment and real-time communication? So would it be possible for me to make an application that receives Dash content, does a mix of different uh, video content, and then retransfer that using WebRTC? <laughs> because you say the video and audio is uh, triggered, the sending is triggered by the browser without going, w without the application doing that. But is it possible to also control what video and audio is, is being transferred? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what do you mean when you say real-time uh, communication as a delay? Because the, the problem of delays in Internet is an old problem, you know? And uh, if you think to solve uh, ex uh, using an end-to-end -end approach, could be difficult or almost impossible unless we start to put some uh, control in the Internet that is an old, difficult story. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll, take it. I'll take it again. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, one problem is, uh, I put into the spec that real time in this context means that you're supposed to be able to do an action and get a reaction from the uh, entity on the other side on the order of, of less than hundreds of milliseconds. Knowing that it's 170 milliseconds round trip from, from here to California, that was not lightly chosen. I'd, I'd like to get it faster, but light just doesn't go that fast. But uh, there are a number of unsolved issues in the internet. One of them is called buffer bloat. And uh, this basically has to be solved. And there are a couple of promising approaches to getting solutions that work so that either your packets get there in reasonable time, given how far away the other guy is, or you, they don't get there at all. The, but uh, we're trying to separate the problems a bit so that WebRTC is not trying to solve buffer bloat, and buf buffer bloat is not trying to solve WebRTC. So I'm uh, very anxious to figure out how we can make it all fit together. One of Mikael's uh, favorite uh, subjects is the so-called RMCAT working group, which is about estimating how much data you can send without causing con congestion instead of detecting that you have congested the network and have to back off. But uh, that's also something that will take time to resolve and I'm not sure, I, I, or I'm sure I don't have all the answers today. Maybe a, a bit a simpler answer. WebRTC is not going to make the underlying IP infrastructure faster than it is and, and more more real time capable. Uh, but there was a lot of lot a lot of thinking going into designing the multiplexing of di these different streams onto one uh, UDP stream as viewed from net and firewalls, etc. And and how to do the real time. Um, uh, transfer over that using standard protocols and mixing them in, yeah, but Harold knows a lot more about that. But on, on the simple side, that's that's how it is done. You know. I, I have a pair. I have a question. <laughs> so here's a question for for the panel. Just looking at this, I've been looking at this slide for quite a while now, and uh, 
to me, you know, it shows some facts and some opportunities and various things, but it also raised at least one question for me. And this is on the left side where there is this arrow pointing to I.O. devices and UI devices. Uh, when Max talked about these various devices we're using today, you know, it, it made me think of the keynote two days ago where we were seeing these, uh, you know, animations of things that would be adapted to different screens and, and trying to make faces look good even on this screen, even on that screen. Okay, that wouldn't be happening in real time, but I'm wondering, uh, is, is WebRTC with its, inter with its in interfaces that would access your hardware, is it going to be enough to just use that and you're going to get good output and input on all kinds of devices, all kinds of screens, all kinds of resolutions, or is there going to be transcoding needed in the browser, or who's going to take care of this, or is there, is there some unresolved stuff there, or is it just not a problem? I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. Somebody? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe to clarify that point, uh, WebRTC today already has to hook up to the to the local I/O devices for audio and video, obviously. Um, but there is a whole um, issue that has been debated on, on the scientific yeah. side for 20 years, which is multi-device user interfaces, multiple screens, uh, multiple channels. That now, with uh, the second screen wave uh, pushed by uh, the entertainment. Uh, uh, consumer electronics companies uh, takes on and, and uh, brings awareness of, of, of these opportunities to the general public. And uh, we'll see a lot happening in, the, in that area in the, in the next couple of years. And, and second uh, screens um, combining web tablets with uh, LCD uh, television sets um, is, is becoming standard. And there are weird, you know, standards taking place in that, in that area, you know, um, that don't do uh, the internet any good. And that's why I bring up, up this issue that WebRTC may also uh, tap into that space and, and get it straightened. 